Our next speaker has a particular interest in the cross-cultural transfer of objects, textile technology and aesthetics, resulting from colonial trade, appropriation and artistic inspiration. She is an anthropologist and museum curator and has been associated with the James Cook University Australia since 1992, initially as a lecturer at the Material Culture Unit in Townsville and currently as a senior research fellow at the College of Art, Society and Education at the Cairns campus. Here to speak on translation and translocation, Javanese Batek in Europe and Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Maria Ronska Friend. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very grateful for being given the opportunity to share with you many years of my research into Javanese batik and how it became inspiration to textile arts in other parts of the world. Textiles frequently move beyond the borders of places where they've been produced and they connect distant societies and group of people. Simply they are portable items and being easily transportable over long distances, they are among, among the most popular trade goods. In most cases, cross-cultural transfers of textile techniques and decorative motifs have been preceded by trade in these goods. Japanese batik, however, is an exception to this rule. It was rather the knowledge of a technique of Javanese batik and Javanese aesthetics and not textiles themselves that were transferred to other countries and became a source of inspiration for artists, textile designers and producers across the world. Today I will present two case studies. Uh, the transfer and adaptation of Javanese batik technique to European arts during the Art Nouveau and Art Deco roughly this is the period between 1890 and 1930. And the second topic will be a similar process that took place in Africa. Both were the outcome of colonial relationships and both commenced rapidly at the same, approximately at the same time around 1890. Yet, uh, and each of those uh, transfers of Javanese batik to the other continent left a very significant and long lasting uh, legacy that is present uh, even today. And yet uh, those two transfers of uh, batik uh, aesthetics and technique to Africa and Europe, uh, uh, they were completely independent of each other, simply there was no crossover and uh, therefore I will present them quite uh, separately. However, both of them, they were the outcome of colonial relationship between the Netherlands and Indonesia. Uh, first of all, we will look at the transfer of uh, Javanese batik technique to Europe, Javanese technique as well as the aesthetics. And actually there were two reasons why towards the end of the 19th century um, Europeans became interested in this group of Javanese uh, textiles and the method of their production. First of all, in the second half of the 19th century, in Europe there was a strong revival of handwork and there was also an opposition towards industrial mass-produced decorative objects. You have to remember that it was uh, the time of industrial revolution and even household items, decorative items, they were made by machines. So there was a strong reaction to it and many artists decided to revive old traditions, old techniques and they favored uh, objects made by hand. They decided to work with industry on reviving those uh, old crafts and techniques. At the same time, Europe experienced a new wave of fascination with the Far Eastern arts. And in particular, it was Japanese art in most of countries. But uh, for the Dutch, uh, it was the art of the colony, country which is today known as Indonesia, and especially it was the art of 
Java, not only batik, but many other uh, aspects of Javanese arts that, uh, especially music and performing arts, that became inspiration for a number of Dutch artists. So, towards the end of the 19th century, as I mentioned, uh, the Dutch became interested in batik because uh, Japanese batik offered uh, Western artists those qualities that they admired most. Uh, it was um, hand-applied wax resist, which meant that each object produced was quite unique, and that was that objection to machine production of decorative objects. And uh, at the same time, being a highly flexible technique, batik allowed a great degree of personal expression. The first artist who is credited with introduction of a batik technique to European arts was uh, Karel Leon Cacher. He was a young student in his early 20s, uh, studying at a pedagogical school in Amsterdam. And it happened that he visited with uh, his friends an exhibition in uh, Ethnographical Museum in Amsterdam, around 1890 it took place, and he saw a group of uh, Javanese textiles, and he became interested not so much in the patterns, the designs of those fabrics, but rather he was intrigued by the technique uh, that they were made with. And later on his own, he started to make his own batiks. And this portrait of a warrior, which we see here, it was produced around 1892, and this is one of the first known European batik. This cloth also illustrates some of the technical problems that European artists experienced at that time. Because uh, at that time in Europe, commonly used were aniline dyes, and because of batik uh, process, they had to be used in low temperature. They were not durable, they didn't produce uh, satisfactory results, and they faded quite quickly. So they thought there were many, initially at the first stage of a transfer of this Javanese batik technique to Europe, there were really many um, technical challenges that uh, the artists had to face. So uh, Karel Leon Cachet was rather disappointed with uh, his early batiks made on fabric, and therefore soon after, around 1896, uh, he turned towards applying wax resist to the decoration of parchment. And parchment leather, it absorbs dyes more easily in low temperatures. And ever since, he was actually working with that uh, material with parchment. Those uh, Karel Leon Cachet batiks, which uh, you see here, they are in the, uh, well, the warrior portrait of a warrior in a collection of a Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And those uh, containers, which are actually a little bit similar to bamboo tubes, uh, like we know from Kalimantan. Um, they are in uh, they are in Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. So that was those were the first attempts with introducing the technique of batik to the Netherlands. This is another early example of but much more ambitious on a large scale. It was batik room, which was created by Gerrit Dijsselhoff in 1895. Uh, that was um, a room which was uh, created for Dr. Van Horn in Amsterdam, who decided to have uh, his whole room covered with large panels of batik fabric. And so those panels that you see, you see only three of them, but actually there is more than a dozen in a whole room. And this room you can today see in Gemeente Museum in Den Haag. So those, all of those panels, they were made with batik technique, and they also were additionally embroidered especially there where he had problems and there were drops of wax which fallen in places which he didn't uh, plan. That's where his wife would place embroidery at times to cover up that. But sometimes it was intentional embroidery. Uh, what is interesting, um, those fabrics have faded over the time, but you can see that their colors are blue and brown, like Central Java those batik kain sogan I was mentioning a little bit earlier when we were looking at Tagore collection. Um, simply those were natural dyes and after those early um, experiments with aniline dyes which were not very successful, the Dutch artist decided to use central Javanese dyes which are in principle blue and brown. And 
and they were very uh, faithful to, to those dyes and those colors. You can see here two further examples. One is batik, uh, very much in Art Deco style by De Wilde, which is in a collection of Tropen Museum, and the other, this is just one panel of a large screen which was created by a Dutch artist, Ries, and it's in Boston Fine Arts Museum. So what you see here, definitely we have no Javanese ornaments, uh, no Javanese motifs, but we have Javanese colors. And that was typical for those early uh, batiks which were made in the Netherlands. And in the last decade of the 19th century, the technique of batik was limited in principle to the Netherlands. And in 1900, Dutch artists presented those batiks at the World Exhibition in Paris. And it was a sensation. They became extremely popular. They had very good press, good reviews. They've been seen by a number of people. And what we see after 1900, the technique of batik conquers, conquers all of Europe. Batiks are made in a number of countries, from uh, virtually Spain to Scandinavia. Almost in every country I recorded that there were artists who were interested with batik at that time. But the uh, most popular batik was in France, Germany, and Poland. There were also attempts to um, improve Javanese tools used to apply wax. <laughs> Uh, you can see, for example, on this um, first image, there is a lady and she's using glass chanting, which was invented in Germany. Um, on the other photo, we have a, a batik workshop in uh, Paris, uh, which was very active after the First World War and which was actually organized in a similar way to Javanese uh, batik workshops. Those European tools, improvement, especially on chanting, soon after it was found that they were not so great, and most artists return to Javanese tools. Um, from those images you've seen previously, you've noticed that batik was used, the technique of batik was used mainly to produce large panels of fabrics which were used in interior decoration. However, around 1908-1909, batik also enters um, fashion, and it's becoming increasingly popular to produce garments for European ladies. And um, especially uh, Paul Poiret, who was a very famous fashion designer at the time, he produced a version of evening coats which were decorated with batik technique. Once again, they were in blue, brown, or yellow colors. This one you can see that it has got uh, this type of a triangle like we have on many sarongs, uh, also here in Malaysia, he introduced to that evening coat. Uh, unfortunately, um, to my knowledge, none of those uh, garments survived uh, in uh, museums or private collections. We know them, however, from a number of photographs and drawings and uh, illustrations. Uh, um, there are many archival records, so we know he produced that. And um, the other image, it is also an evening gown, which was uh, produced in Paris in uh, um, Madame Pangon workshop. This is this workshop which we saw uh, at the previous uh, slide. Uh, she learned batik technique in Harlem. She went to Holland to study batik. Uh, so in principle, um, the Netherlands, especially Harlem, it was a very important place for the dissemination of the knowledge of uh, batik technique in Europe and therefore many batiks uh, they initially, in other countries, they were made in the style of those Dutch batiks, and also only later, they create, started to create kind of autonomous style. And uh, Art Deco style also entered the Dutch batik at that time. This is part of a huge scarf, which was uh, batik by Ranghil Day in uh, 1928. It is in Stedelijk Museum nowadays. And it is very interesting that uh, actually this technique of batik was embraced by two decorative styles, very different styles, which dominated Western arts uh, at the end of the 19th century and beginning first half of the 20th century. It was Art Nouveau and Art Deco, because after all, they were very different in their approach to design. Um, for example, Art Nouveau, which uh, dominated decorative arts uh, 
in Europe between 1890 until the First World War, it favored rather soft winding lines and very gentle, subtle uh, color combinations. And uh, Art Deco, which became uh, very popular after the First World War, it was the style of 1920s, 1930s. Uh, it favored rather geometrical forms, a very sharp, straight line, and bright, contrasting colors. But what those two styles had in common, they favored ornament, and it was two-dimensional ornament. And therefore, batik uh, technique was very suitable for both of them, and therefore batik uh, was present in applied arts for almost 50 years uh, in Europe. So far I concentrated mainly on the transfer of batik technique, but now I would like to show you some examples where the transfer of technique was also accompanied by the transfer of uh, or borrowing of Javanese uh, aesthetics, uh, principles of uh, composition, and also we find the Javanese motifs uh, um, in some European arts. Uh, this process was uh, so intensive in the 1920s that uh, some art historians uh, uh, term it as Javanism, in a way similar to Japanism, the presence of uh, Japanese aesthetics in European art. So we have Javanism, this is the Java which is present in European art. Probably the most interesting uh, artist um, um, who embraced very deeply Javanese aesthetics was Chris Lebeau from Harlem. Uh, the first uh, batik which you see here, it is Javanese batik from Central Java, from Jogjakarta. It is made in this uh, Kainsogan style, blue and brown. And as I already mentioned, many of the Dutch artists use this color combination, Central Javanese one. However, Chris Lebeau went much further. Some of the um, Japanese batiks, they are made with, in so-called nitic style, with nitic method, which means that they don't have continuous lines. All the outlines of the motifs, they are built of thousands of tiny dots. And that was the method which also um, Chris Lebeau used in his work. It's a very difficult uh, technique, almost like a meditation on clove, very slow one. Uh, after all, it is much easier to draw a straight line rather than making the same line by marking with uh, tiny dots. Uh, um, but uh, uh, Lebeau became master of uh, nitic technique. He also knew extremely well um, the Kain Sogan uh, process. And those samples which uh, you see on the second image, uh, they were made by Chris Lebeau. They are in a museum in Basel currently, and this is step by step uh, he shows here, those are instruction samples for his students, where he shows how to make this blue and brown Kain Sogan batik in Europe. And here, this is a section of a large panel, which uh, Chris Lebon made using this uh, Javanese uh, nitic method, those tiny dots, uh, thousands of them. Um, this is in museum in uh, Assen, in Drenthe. And um, it is a really um, extremely precise work uh, and highly controlled and very detailed. So if you look at Javanese batiks, those are exactly the same feature that you find in Javanese aesthetics. There are no um, cracking of wax, there are no accidental effects. Everything is very measured, very controlled. So Le Beau, he did not use Javanese uh, motifs, he didn't transfer them, he didn't copy them, but he used the same underlying principle of uh, making batik fabric, but he translated that to the environment of uh, the aesthetics uh, of uh, his time. However, as regards the technical aspect of it, this is extremely very a high quality of work, and when I show photographs of uh, those batiks in, uh, in workshops uh, in Java, uh, people could not believe that somebody outside Java was able to make batik of such high technical accomplishments. Uh, um, he really was a master of this um, technique. And he produced uh, 
Well, I know around 20, 30 examples of such batiks from museum collections. Perhaps there were more, but didn't survive. So he worked in this style and uh, in this technique for um, at least uh, 15 years, and the results are really astonishing. So that was, uh, he also had many students, many followers. So this kind of style like we see here became very popular in the Netherlands, especially before the First World War. And uh, more than that, this very precise drawing, blue and brown, went beyond uh, Dutch textiles. I found such motifs, uh, uh, the style of decoration on ceramic objects, for example. So uh, many other objects which were decorated uh, in, at that time in the Netherlands, they have the marks of this style, blue and brown and very detailed Central Javanese, but they are not always recognized as Central Javanese style, but for, that's how I see it. Um, now this is a completely different example of uh, the borrowings from Javanese aesthetics. Uh, uh, what you see at the top, it is a uh, Javanese batik. This is this uh, breast head, head scarf, uh, breast uh, scarf uh, kanban, which is usually worn by Javanese women instead of a blouse covering torso. This is from Northern Coast. You can see from the bright, colorful colors. It's not central Java. But those uh, fabrics below, the central one and the lower one, they were made in Poland in the 1920s by association of artists, which was known as Krakow workshops. And actually the authors of those fabrics are teenager girls, because this group put a lot of stress on developing artistic skills of children, and they introduced uh, uh, a group of uh, teenagers into batik. So, um, so those batiks, uh, they are very colorful, they are floral in design because those were the aesthetics of Polish folk art. That was something that was uh, very easy for people to accept. So what they adopted from Java were usually those floral patterns and very colorful ones. But you can still see that there are elements of uh, uh, coming from uh, Javanese uh, batiks. Like, of course, here we have still see, see this diamond field and this composition was uh, repeated on a number of Polish batiks. And this uh, shawl here, it is like, once again, sarong, uh, transformed sarong decoration with those uh, triangles, tumpals, and uh, this would be the burden with uh, flowers. So once again, many, many of those uh, batiks have been produced in Krakow at that time. And what is very special and interesting is the fact that all of them, they've been made with natural dyes. And if you look that usually on an average fabric we have five to six colors, it was a very complex process. So it was not so much blue and brown, although they also used it. It was more rather multicolored and using natural dyes because that was their uh, philosophical principle that uh, this group of artists rejected uh, synthetic dyes. They said that uh, it is uh, very important to revive uh, the old tradition of dyeing. It was um, 1920s in Poland. And those are um, other examples. Um, um, the first batik is from Java and the other one is, was made by those teenager girls uh, in Poland. Uh, so the second one is uh, definitely Kain Sogan style, blue and brown. But you can see the birds, the, um, the flowers, how closely they've been uh, actually imitated here in uh, Polish folk art, but uh, in Poland they were not uh, considered to be an oriental art or foreign art. It was very much accepted as a local art. And more than that, because uh, in Eastern Europe there is a tradition of decorating Easter eggs with wax. And therefore many artists said, well, batik is not a foreign product which is brought to Poland. We simply uh, move this technique from Easter eggs, uh, from those shells, uh, to the fabrics. But, well, as a matter of fact, it was Javanese batik, but that was the justification and for much easier entry and acceptance of uh, batik in Poland, and uh, this technique became extremely popular over the year. So, so far I presented um, uh, the 
examples of a transfer of Javanese aesthetics which were usually associated with the application of wax drawing. So those were Javanese motifs because it was a batik technique. However, in the first half of the 20th century, what we see, because of a great popularity of Javanese batik, there are also numerous collections of those fabrics which are organized in Europe. That's the time when many museums start collecting Javanese batik, but this is also the time when we have private collectors who buy batik textiles, and among them are many significant artists. And those private collections of uh, batik uh, had an impact on the art. So I would like to present from a whole group of those artists just three uh, quite significant persons. The first of them is um, Henry van der Velde, who was a Belgian artist, but uh, active uh, between 1900 and the First World War in Germany. He was a very prolific uh, artist. He worked in a number of fields, including interior decoration. He was well aware of batik. He knew this technique very well. A number of his students used batik, but he himself, he never made batik. But he was uh, very much uh, attracted by two uh, Javanese batik designs, and in his interior projects, he used printed, factory printed clothes with Javanese designs to decorate the interior. So we see here an uh, um, interior of a club, tennis club in Germany. Um, where he used uh, that cloth to cover the couch, but he also used uh, um, in that interior uh, the same design, uh, batik design for curtains, uh, um, uh, wall panels. Uh, he used, um, I don't know, 30, 40 meters of that cloth, at least in that interior. It was a very powerful experience if you look at photographs of the whole interior because uh, it's this diagonal design of those Javanese sultans is really extremely dynamic and overtaking the whole space. And the second photo I showed you just for comparison is how the same pattern was used to be used in the right context, worn as garments of aristocracy. This is the crown prince at uh, Surakarta and his wife uh, at home, and they wear this uh, um, diagonal uh, um, Parangrusak design that uh, Henry van der Velde, well, he fell in love with this design and he used that in a number of his projects. And uh, more than that, he also uh, uh, designed uh, patterns for printed textiles or woven textiles um, to be produced in Krefeld in Germany at the beginning of the 20th century. And they are very much based. Uh, also on this batik parang rusak design. But uh, as I said, he never made batik, he never worked himself with batik technique, but the aesthetics of Java are very strong in a number of his works. The second uh, person uh, whom I would like to mention from those European artists who had collections of batik textiles and uh, were quite inspired by those uh, designs. Uh, it was Charles Rennie Mackintosh, uh, a Scottish uh, artist who is better known as the architect of Glasgow. Um, however, um, uh, during the First World War, um, he moved to London, and because he hasn't got so much work as an architect at that time during the war, he started to design patterns for textiles. And uh, we know from some sources that he had a group of uh, um, Javanese batik fabrics in his uh, collection, and a number of those fabrics which he designed at that time, they have a very close affinity with a composition and some uh, designs of Javanese batik. This is, uh, for example, here, uh, Parang Rusak, known in its version as uh, Parang Churigo, and we actually have here in this room a gentleman who is in row two who, who has that kind, shared with that kind of uh, design, and this is very much this pattern which inspired uh, um, Charles Rennie Mackintosh. He also included uh, as a background pattern of one of his watercolors, that uh, design. Um, 
However, those uh, Japanese uh, designs only occasionally appear in Macintosh textile designs in a version that is close to its uh, Japanese prototype. Uh, in most cases, the artist translated the diagonal bands of uh, this pattern into rows of tulips, daisies, uh, stylus leaves, uh, peacock eyes, and even human figures. This is the odalisk uh, motif in here. So it was rather the principle, it was the general principle of a composition rather than the actual motif being copied in his case. And uh, finally, the third artist whom I would like to pre present, who was inspired by Batik to some extent, was uh, Henri Matisse, whom I don't have to present here. But he was also attracted to this particular pattern, Parang Rusak. And his uh, fascination with uh, exotic textiles is well known. He, in his person collection, he had a range of oriental fabrics, usually from North Africa and Middle East, but in September 1930, he bought uh, several Javanese batiks. And we know that at least one of them was decorated with design from the Parang family, because uh, around 1935, uh, Matisse created a series of uh, pen drawings of uh, nude models who were placed against a background filled with this uh, design. And this Javanese uh, design is here represented very faithfully. You can even see the rows of those small rhomboids which separate uh, the lines of those parang spirals. They've been reproduced very clearly in here. So um, he, there is at least a dozen of such drawings in which he uses this parang rusak design, but also I found the Tumpal designs, those triangles uh, that, are, that appear on uh, Javanese batik sarongs. Uh, so in most of those drawings, um, Matisse once again um, displays his mastery of strong, uh, pure lines. And uh, the, parang, the lines of Parang Rusak design in the background, they fill large sections uh, of um, those drawings and they help to bind together all compositional elements like uniting, bringing them together and transforming them into well-integrated uh, linear planes. Um, what's happened to Batik after 1930 in Europe? Well, I have to say that uh, after 1930, quite different uh, uh, currents started uh, to dominate European aesthetics and uh, applied arts, where usually there was very little thought given to ornament, uh, rather the shape, uh, racial construction of object was important. And therefore, after 1930, the technique of batik moves into the fine arts. And what we see is uh, the emergence of batik paintings. And this process is once again common throughout Europe. Uh, this is an example of uh, batik switch, one of the batik artists which is active today in Poland. Uh, you can see it's very different to those batiks which were made in 1920s in Poland. I estimate that uh, currently there are between three and 400 batik artists in Europe who are involved on a regular basis in this technique. This is quite large, significant group but uh, they usually work with uh, batik uh, painting. They, we don't find so much batik in applied arts uh, nowadays in Europe. And I think that uh, batik in Malaysia and this excellent exhibition which we see here, it is also an offshoot of the transfer of batik technique into the fine arts which occurred before the Second World War already. This process started then. And now let's move to Africa, completely different process uh, of a transfer of Javanese uh, batik. And uh, if you visit um, Central or Western Africa nowadays, you find that a number of people wear batik, uh, wear, they wear uh, printed industrial uh, fabrics, which are decorated with designs which are very similar to Javanese uh, batik. The Javanese roots uh, of those uh, patterns are indisputable. So how did it happen? Uh, if you ask Africans, in a number of cases, they are not aware 
how it's possible that they are wearing patterns uh, which originated in Java. Well, um, to start from beginning the story, although I'll try to make it short, we have to go back to Indonesia, to Java, 200 years back in time, when the governor of Java was Thomas Stanford Raffles. He was the governor of Java for five years because during Napoleon Wars, um, Java was for a short time British colony. And of course we know Raffles rather as a founder of Singapore, but I would say that his contribution towards uh, reforms uh, in Indonesia, especially in Java, were very significant uh, as well. And he was interested uh, in uh, local culture, literature, uh, crafts, and uh, also textiles. We have the first description of uh, batik um, technique in European language just provided by Raffles in his history of Java. At the same time, he was aware that batik was made by hand. Uh, it was a time-consuming process uh, to decorate one piece of cloth, and he came up with an idea that it would be a fantastic business for British manufacturers to produce uh, imitations of uh, batik patterns in the UK and export them to Indonesia. And with that in mind, in 1912, he sent uh, samples of Javanese batiks to London and a large number of fabrics, they were printed, hand printed those days, uh, and sent back to Java. Two years later, he's got those fabrics and this is the advert in a government uh, newspaper which states that those are fabrics uh, made uh, European, European made clothes imitated from Javanese patterns. They will be disposed by public auction and so on. So that was the first attempt to sell European uh, imitations of batiks uh, in Java. And actually, in spite of great hopes and intentions, it was initially it was a total failure because uh, those uh, colors produced in UK, they were not fast. After the first washing, they were all gone and people didn't want to buy it. But uh, the manufacturers in Europe, they've got the message, they started to produce much better quality dyes for those fabrics. And for most of the 19th century, uh, poor people in Java, they would be wearing this type of uh, fabrics, which were printed in factories in the Netherlands, Switzerland, Belgium, and even in England. And uh, this lasted for quite a few decades, and it was a great business for textile manufacturers in Europe until around 1860 batik fabrics on Java started to be printed with chap. This is this metal stamp like it's also used in Malaysian batik. And uh, in a short time Java became self-sufficient in batik production, started to export in large numbers of fabrics to other parts of Southeast Asia and there was no need for those European imports. So European manufacturers started to lose market in Indonesia. And they decided to look for new markets, new customers, rather than changing this very complicated technology of producing those textiles. And around 1890, they sent first examples of those fabrics, Javanese batiks, to West Africa. And uh, they found a very successful market there. There was a very good response to them. So soon after, uh, Javanese uh, batik uh, imitations, those produced in Europe, started to be exported in large numbers to Africa rather than to Java. And what we see here, this is an early example of uh, this European uh, imitation which was hand printed. You can see it was a very rough cloth. Uh, uh, there was, um, well, certainly uh, a person uh, of uh, mm, higher a social standing in Java would never wear such a cloth. It was really for those who could not uh, afford handmade batik. Um, that was a child sarong. It is in a museum of printed fabrics in Milus in France, the, the early example. And uh, now we see the top photo. This is Javanese batik from central Java, that one with Garuda motif, palmet, Kain Sogan. And the lower one, this is um, a fabric printed in UK for Africa around 1910. 
from the collection of a British Museum. So very slowly, steadily, we can see the transformation of those uh, motifs from original Javanese batik. Slowly, they are becoming adjusted to uh, the aesthetics of Africa and expectations of the local markets. You'll find that uh, today, well, those uh, printed fabrics with uh, designs which originated from Java, they are very popular, very common. They are used as uh, everyday dress, but also used at special ceremonies. And they became, um, well, very important aspect of West African culture. This, is, uh, this cloth uh, is actually very much uh, um, associated with African identity. You'll see many Africans on special occasions wearing those uh, fabrics. So that process of simulation was very strong. However, the Javanese roots are very strong. And as you see here, uh, and they are very clear, um, well, the first photo is from uh, a wedding ceremony at uh, Mankunegaran Palace in Solo. And you see that a very similar cloth is worn in uh, Ghana. Uh, at the same time, this is all beginning of a 21st uh, century. Those photos were taken more or less at the same time. So this is uh, the transfer of those Javanese aesthetics to Africa. And now I would like to show you just uh, some examples uh, how the Javanese uh, uh, patterns and colors have been changed to suit better the taste of uh, African customers and local aesthetics. So the first fabric, there, there will be several examples, the first fabric is always uh, uh, Javanese batik, and the second one is African. So this one, this is the composition very popular in uh, uh, Central Java, known as Pagisore, and uh, this is also very much uh, accepted in uh, this diagonal composition, also in Ghana, where you have darker and lighter side of a cloth. But uh, you see that the colors in Africa became much brighter usually they would be too bright for a Javanese person to wear it in Indonesia. And this is the transformation of the Garuda motif known as Sawat in central Java, which, uh, well, in Java, of course, it has to comply with uh, certain strict regulations, how you present uh, this motif. But in Africa, virtually, you have a lot of freedom. So here it's been uh, transformed into kind of a flowering bush uh, tree. Sometimes it turns up to be a pineapple, sometimes a snail. Uh, there are many, many possibilities of changing those uh, motifs. Here we have uh, Parang Rusak, and look uh, what's happened to Parang Rusak. This is uh, uh, translated into a row of fans, and this is a fabric which is very popular in Nigeria. And uh, to say more, we, we can't see well on those photos, but those fans, they are covered with gold with a layer of gold. So this is really expensive fabric. This is a little bit like those Javanese kind Prada clothes that were used for weddings that also had a layer of gold. So we have a similar here translation. And actually, this Africans love to include into their printed fabrics everyday objects. So uh, you find, of course, also a computers and mobile phones. But uh, yes, uh, whatever. <laughs> um, this is sometimes maybe a dream that they would like to have it. <laughs> maybe this is some sense of humor. Maybe this is a matter of prestige. I don't know exactly, but uh, this is very popular. And uh, this fabric is uh, uh, based on uh, Javanese uh, batik, which was produced for Sumatra. It has uh, Arabic inscriptions uh, from Quran. And uh, in Africa, those inscriptions, they are just marked. You can guess that those are those uh, uh, Arabic inscriptions. And the, the design has got quite a new meaning and name. And it is usually presented by wives uh, when they are pleased with their husband. So that's why the name of this uh, pattern is Good Husband. It's from the British Museum collection. British Museum collects uh, a number of those contemporary African prints and their meanings and significance. You can find it on the website. Oh, this is uh, everyday items. Uh, the top batik, uh, this is uh, 
a headscarf from the northern coast of Java, as the red color indicates. It's North Java, but uh, this is Mali, but it's 1980, so this TV is a little bit old-fashioned. I'm sure that uh, nowadays we would have an uh, uh, up-to-date model presented there. But uh, you can see that, however, the translation of those, the transfer of those aesthetics and translation to the local uh, social uh, milieu and expectations is uh, very clearly marked. The Javanese roots, we can still see very clearly the principles of exhibition. This kind of a horror vacui where the whole space has to be filled in with small patterns in Africa, it is still present. But Africans also like strong uh, cracking of wax and that we'll find on a number of their fabrics. What else is very important for Africans? Uh, uh, those are printed fabrics, uh, factory printed, but also the printed names, uh, which is kind of a guarantee that those fabrics originate from certain places. However, during the last 20 years, we have many forgeries because those fabrics, some of them are very expensive. And especially during the last 15 years, a number of forgeries, uh, those imitations uh, coming from China. Um, some of them, they are made uh, officially legally in China, but some of them, they are smuggled to Africa. If there is a pattern that sells well in African market, then very quickly it's produced uh, in Shanghai or Hong Kong, and uh, within a couple of weeks it's uh, available in, in Africa. And as a result, a number of uh, local African factories uh, had to close down because they can't compete with this uh, Chinese... Uh, manufacturing. Um, very often uh, those uh, printed fabrics uh, inspired by uh, batik, Javanese batik, uh, well they have their own new life of course in, in uh, um, Africa. There is no transfer of meaning or symbolism from Java if only because there was never a direct connection. It is all facilitated via European producers in the first place. But uh, the local names given to fabrics, sometimes they are associated with proverbs, sometimes proverbs, sometimes they are associated with events. And for example, this uh, fabric, this is a very expensive cloth, which was a uh, new design with this uh, handbag. Uh, it came on the market uh, at the time when uh, Obama, um, president of US, and his wife visited Africa. And immediately in the market, women said, well, this is Michelle Obama's bag. And uh, it became immediately a bestseller. And in spite of its very high price, <laughs> it is still selling extremely well. <laughs> so um, there would be many stories to, to tell like that. But uh, you have to understand that those fabric, uh, although you can still see the strong deep roots of Java in their aesthetics, they have their own new life and they are very deeply embedded in the local culture and local traditions. Uh, we also have uh, a number of um, uh, fashion uh, um, garments uh, which use those uh, prints. Uh, nowadays, uh, those printed fabrics are promoted as a luxury textiles in, in Africa. So this is one of the examples from Ivory Coast. But uh, this is using tambal motif. This is like a patchwork motif, one of classical motifs of Java. And the other, the first photo, this is uh, a close-up of this child sarong, the oldest batik imitation which I showed uh, previously. So you can see that the continuity for almost 200 years of uh, those same uh, patterns which were printed by uh, um, European uh, um, industrialists uh, is, is still current. Well, uh, those fabrics became uh, so important that they also uh, entered uh, the arts and uh, um, they also gained quite new unexpected uh, meanings in uh, modern conceptual art. Yinka Shonibare is just one of several artists, African artists, uh, who use those uh, fabrics in, in their works. Uh, um, he uses uh, those printed textiles approximately since the 1990s. There were many exhibitions of his works uh, uh, across the world. And he uses them because uh, they say that uh, um, what is important about those uh, 
printed fabrics uh, for Africa with Javanese designs is their eclectic nature, which incorporates uh, traits of so many cultures, and that this kind of cloth parallels very much his personal experience because uh, he's uh, British Nigerian brought uh, brought up actually in UK, then returned to Nigeria, then again to UK. And he says that uh, um, the use of those fabrics in his installations, uh, uh, it is a metaphor for a very tangled uh, relationship between Africa and Europe. Uh, and it also is a challenge to uh, common assumptions and stereotypes, especially as regards the notions of cultural authenticity and uh, appropriation. Appropriation is a very important uh, issue, of course, uh, in case of uh, those uh, textiles printed with uh, patterns which originated from Java. This is another installation by uh, Shani Barre. This is uh, Scramble for Africa. Um, his, um, well, um, typical mark, those are the headless uh, mannequins. This is the distinctive feature of many of his installations, headless mannequins which are dressed uh, sometimes in Victorian costumes, um, but always made from those uh, um, African wax prints uh, and usually they are arranged in a kind of theatrical tableau. And here those are Europeans who are dividing the continent of Africa, scramble for Africa. Well, um, when discussing uh, relations between Africa and Indonesia, there is one more person I have uh, to mention, and uh, this is um, actually Nelson uh, Mandela. Um, Nelson Mandela, um, during his visit to Indonesia in the 1990s, he was given several batik shirts as a present from uh, President Suharto, and simply he fell in love with them. And uh, later, he used to order those shirts from Jakarta via Indonesian embassy in South Africa. The order was sent to foreign affairs in Jakarta and so on. And Ivan Tirta, who was the best Indonesian designer at that time, he would produce those shirts for Mandela. I counted, looking just a photograph, I counted that at least he had a dozen, probably more, of those really high quality batik shirts. But what is um, very uh, interesting here, that uh, he decided not to personalize those designs, because uh, in a way it would be very easy to change those designs according to his wish, introduce some African elements to express his identity or so, no. Pandela never wanted that. He always wore classical Javanese design. He never altered that. And actually, the same share, type of shirt that was worn by Mandela, same patterns could be worn by president of Indonesia. So he was above that. He didn't want to use uh, his uh, shirt or his garments as a kind of an outward uh, sign of identity that many other head of uh, states do. He was, uh, in a way, uh, above that. And uh, there is one more interesting, the last uh, example which I want to present. It is uh, um, printed uh, this African Javanese cloth in Japan. It is a project which is known as uh, Wa Africa. So in a way, this uh, Java-inspired fabric returned to the Far East. <laughs> uh, but this time it's been applied to produce a series of Japanese kimono. So those are so-called African kimono. This is a result of a collaboration between African designer from Cameroon, but who was brought up in Paris, Serge Mwanga, who lives in Japan. And uh, all those kimonos, they were produced by a traditional kimono maker, Kururi, in Japan. And it was a very new fashion statement in Japan because those are completely new fabrics used in kimono production, completely new color combination. The colors in Japanese kimonos are usually uh, subdued uh, and uh, they represent quite different aesthetics. However, those, uh, it seems they appeal very well with a young uh, generation who likes to experiment with new colors and new patterns. So this is uh, another step in this uh, very 
complicated journey of Javanese batik across the land's uh, continents. Uh, just to, to summarize all what we've seen, I have to say that um, I have some remarks here because uh, we know that we live in time of um, liquid modernity where the flow of information and images has greatly intensified, certainly during the last two decades. And of course, uh, cross-cultural global contacts between various uh, societies uh, are quite old, and actually this is an ancient phenomenon, it's nothing new. But what is happening today, what is new today, with the information revolution and the formation of the global societies, uh, the patterns of cross-cultural transfer, they became less predictable. So in a way, they are also quite uh, fluid and uh, it is uh, this increasingly shifting position of Javanese batik uh, textiles, which we observed in recent years. And uh, it is, in a way, a good illustration of how unpredictable our cultural heritage and its future is. We don't know how it will be used and to what purpose. But somehow it seems that uh, uh, Javanese don't object too much. <laughs> because of this appropriation. Thank you very much.